Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, find your mic. So, as ever, I have the joy of. Oh, good. So, I'm Brian Craig, and this is Darren. Uh, we're going to tag team the presentation a little bit. Um, I'm going to start off. Uh, actually, I should hit the agenda. I should hit the right button. I should hit a button. Oh, there we go. So. I'm going to cover uh, the first bit, sort of give more the leadership management view of how to save you money, and then Darren's going to take over and he's going to talk about it more from an engineering perspective. So without further ado, I need to set some context, uh, just so you know the areas and the space that we operate in. So all the work uh, that we do in Liberty IT is for Liberty Mutual, which is a, a global insurance company. Uh, certainly, you would know them from their local presence of Liberty Ireland, but the majority of their 40,000 employees are based in the US, and the majority of the work we do in developing the software is into the US to support the US insurance market. So Liberty IT itself, um, it's a software house uh, based originally out of Belfast. We now have a Dublin hub, and very, very soon we will have a Galway hub, which uh, Darren is going to be our site lead for. So one of the many aspects we have is not just our great place to work, but also our engineering skills when it comes to cloud engineering, product design, ML ops, data science. And although on the board there you'll see we've got AWS heroes and a number of AWS community builders, we actually are multi-cloud. And I'll talk about, a bit about that during our journey. So um, I was originally not going to talk to this slide or what was on the slide, but I realize it's quite small within the room. So this is our cloud journey, and then I'll overlay how our cost-saving journey goes along with it. So in 2012, we had our first uh, AWS resource deployed, and the majority of our workloads were on-premise. And on-premise for us meant they were based out of three data centers across the US, and then I think there was another eight to 10 data centers based all across the world. As you can imagine, running double-digit number of data centers when you're an insurance company creates a lot of overhead. So I mean, the first saving there is move to the cloud so you can offload that work onto the experts running data centers. And by 2026, we had really got enterprise-wide adoption of moving to the cloud. And we even had a sort of internal certification process built off AWS's, but also layered in the aspects that Liberty Mutual, which is a financial insurance company, has compliance and auditing. We layered on the additional levels, layers that you need when you deploy into the public cloud when you are a fintech company. Quite often in that level, we were using Cloud Foundry containers, and then we also had sandboxes to allow experimentation. And I think if there's one thing you take away from the presentation as well, you must allow experimentation within the cloud before you start optimizing for cost. Otherwise, people will never adopt it within your org. In 2018, uh, we actually moved to having a very much a serverless first mindset Again, looking at not just the cost, but also the, the desire to deliver quicker for the business. And by then, we had production workloads, not just in AWS, but also in Azure and GCP. 2019, uh, we begin decommissioning our different data centers. And now, by 2023, we have over 2,000 workloads in the cloud, and, 70 per, and that effectively is 70% of our actual workloads. So, Going back to the start and then talking about how that affects from an actual cost and cost savings perspective, um, day one, discounts. Nobody plays retail if you have any sort of size in the cloud. As soon as you're at a point where you're actually going to move to a particular cloud, start talking to your account manager about getting discounts. And that's one of the first things we did when we went in in 2012. And we've constantly done that whenever we've gone back to negotiate with any of our vendors. And it's one of the reasons why we actually have both GCP and Azure there, is that we constantly want to be talking to them about what they can provide us, whether it's specialist services, whether it's discount on our costs, or whether that's any professional help from their experts into our space. 
By about 2016, well, actually, it was probably closer to 2018. By 2018, we had enough footprint in the cloud to understand what did we need on a regular basis, and we started to buy reserved capacity. And again, that's saving money because you're paying upfront for a certain amount rather than paying at the time that you use it. And again, you get large discounts on that. So that then takes us on to once you've done your discounting, which is kind of, and your reservations, you've got to look at your cost avoidance. And for us, cost avoidance is about making sure the people that are maintaining the applications, the people that own the applications, know how much it is actually costing them for their application. And realistically, the only way to do this, and David referred to it in his previous talk, was tagging so you can link it to your cost management. So once we started to scale, we put together a very straightforward tagging process so that whenever anything gets deployed into any of the public clouds, it's clear how it can be linked back to the owner of that system so that whenever the costs are attributed, we can actually send, you know, it's an artificial bill because obviously the overall bill just goes to Liberty Mutual, but it's a bill that allows them to understand how much they're spending on a month to month basis. And the other aspect of tags is it also helps you then think about what kind of rules you want to apply as you're going on. So once we had the tags built, we actually started to create a, a billing sort of dashboard. And the important thing there was to make that dashboard completely accessible to everyone within the company. So we built it in Power BI because we had the way to license that to all in the company. But again, any dashboarding tool will work. The most important thing is everybody can access it and the ease of readability. So they understand, oh, that's my stuff. That's the different parts that were costed and that is the actual cost. I think that's, yep. Actually, that is my slide. So I'm gonna pass over Darren. So Darren's a member of my architecture team and we'll slowly be taking up the, the Galway site lead role. Thank you, Brian. I'll come in front of the podium so you can see me. Um, okay, so uh, Brian's cloud journey uh, fondly reminded me of a time in 2016 where I'd just been given the keys to AWS and uh, armed with all of the power and none of the responsibility. I had an email uh, from our public cloud team saying, hey, Darren, you're... Uh, 256 core uh, server with uh, 25 gig network capacity. That's been running for a month. Do you still need it? I said, well, it only says hello world when you hit it, so I, I might just turn that off. But um, the message there is, uh, I mean, cost is obviously very important to an organization, but it also shouldn't uh, hinder any sort of experimentation or uh, innovation. So um, what I'm going to talk about is just uh, how we, as an engineering group, look to architect for efficiency in our, um, in our cloud space. Um, so uh, AWS and in reality the majority of the cloud providers actually have a framework um, such as the well-architected framework from AWS and it's a, an industry evaluated tool provided by AWS that has a series of questions that have been benchmarked and the questions operate across uh, the six different areas with sustainability being the most recent, but it basically allows you to, to uh, determine your operational excellence, how efficient you are with uh, performance, your reliability, your security, and then also the focus of this talk, your cost. And once you've ran through the, um, the series of questions, you come out with your answers, and that allows uh, our teams in Liberty IT to put together some metrics dashboards. And within those dashboards, we encourage the teams basically to track that cost. And you know, every month they're running through these reviews and they're iterating over and over and continue evaluating the health of their application stack that they support against all of these parameters. And those metrics such as cost, then you can see is it trending upwards or is it trending downwards? Same with performance as well. And what we can do then with those metrics is use that data to have informed decisions uh, and conversations with our product owners and our application owners because you know, a lot of the times you know, as a developer you may you know, be raising your hand to say, look, there's a more efficient way of doing this. Can we have some you know, time carved out in our backlog to 
perhaps move to a new technology or can we choose a different server type? And oftentimes business priority takes precedence. But if you have the data and you have these metrics, it makes for a much easier conversation. So certainly I recommend the well-architected framework as a tool. In addition to uh, performing those well-architected reviews, um, a couple of folks here have already said it today, but use that cloud provider tooling. So one such example that jumps out, jumps out to me is the AWS Trusted Advisor. So the, you know, the Trusted Advisor basically like, assesses all of the applications in your account and says, uh, you know, what we feel this is spec too highly. We feel that there's an opportunity for you to reduce cost, and those are present in your application, um, in your account for you to look at. So do take a look at that and see, like, are those opportunities pretty obvious um, from AWS's reports? Another uh, opportunity then as well is if you're operating the serverless space, you have such things as the Lambda Power Tuner. So it allows you to um, simulate running your Lambda application uh, with different scales of memory, and then it'll give you a benchmark to say you, you had a lot of memory and you had a lot of performance, but you know, that's obviously much more expensive. And then you, know, you have a little graph chart that kind of shows you where the sweet spot is. And we've again found that very useful for you know, within our engineering groups, being able to just hit the right measure on cost and performance. Um, another one then on the provider tooling, I guess just to call out, is the carbon footprint tool, which is um, not a direct impact of costs, of course, but if you're looking at your carbon footprint and if you're aiming to reduce your carbon footprint, which the majority of industry should be looking to do now because our customers want to do business with sustainable orgs, then as your carbon footprint goes down, then so too does your uh, cost in the majority of cases. Uh, be cloud native. I think the majority of people in this room will agree that cloud native is um, obviously a pretty easy way to architect for efficiency because um, Again, it was mentioned earlier, a 12-factor application. If you build an application in such a way that it is resistant and tolerable to being shut down, in such a way that it can be scaled upwards and downwards based on demand, then you have full control of the parameters in, uh, in which you can deploy these applications. So, um, so what I've spoke to there is what you can do as an individual application team. Um, but I also want to just touch on what the organization has done to further enable those application teams um, by optimizing through autom autom automation. So uh, Brian spoke to the dashboards that we make in Power BI and like why that visibility is so important because those conversations are continually, dr continually driven off the data. But what we have looked at is actually taking those opportunities and taking those costs and putting them right in front of the developers. So when the developer logs on and they're looking at their application health in the morning, we have a console internal to our organization and the cost is there for everyone to say is like your monthly spend on this was a thousand dollars and it tells you if you're trending upwards or trending downwards and it's a very non-invasive piece of information that um, we find particularly helpful just to highlight opportunities. Other um, opportunities uh, in the automation space is shutdown schedules. So um, early days, um, we basically you know, created a series of lambdas um, that would go out and scan through your accounts and say, you know, you have uh, an RDS here, for example, which is a database provided by AWS. And there may be an opportunity for you to turn this off at the weekend because you know, not everybody's working in non-production environments at the weekend. So those shutdown schedules were created with all these different parameters. So you can have Monday to Friday, you can have Asia Pacific time, you can have US time, and it just give people the tools to allow them to choose when to turn these, you know, massively expensive artifacts off. After that, then we looked at, okay, we've provided the information, we've provided some tooling, but how can we then go on to actually ensure that people are actively engaging and that's through push notifications by emailing these suggestions to, to the teams and to the application owners so they can actually see what they can do to pull the lever and costs. Finally then on expanding that optimization is to, you know, trusting that everybody is building these cloud native applications. 
stop in the RDS instances and basically opting everybody into that schedule. So for a while it was, okay, here's the schedule, but now we kind of say, right, you have to opt out. So it means that the majority of our databases are going offline and non-production at the weekend, and the applications are pretty well architected to cope with that. Again, other opportunities include cleaning up your storage. So for example, if you have a load of backups for an application that you don't even have anymore, we will have created automation that will just scan for all of these um, different orphan storage pieces and uh, take those offline as well. So uh, just to cover some of the lessons learned. So um, these are lessons learned, I guess, just from like the, you know, the organizational perspective of rolling out something like that targeted cost reduction strategy. I think that one of the key things um, is to establish trust and communicate often because you can have these very ambitious policies to shut down your RDS instances, but you absolutely have to communicate your intent in advance because if you don't have a clear and established communication strategy, you may find then that that catches people by surprise and causes um, outages and uh, you know, obviously a lot of frustration. So a trusted uh, partnership and communication pattern with all of your engineers is very important. Again, educating the engineers and incentivizing them to be able to you know, have the, the autonomy to reduce costs themselves and to be you know, excited by it and like the opportunity to, to reduce the costs. And again, I always find that uh, when we're talking about this, it's pretty good to layer in that sustainability piece because people get more excited about reducing their carbon footprint than saving money. So um, that's always a good way to look at it. Other things. Things can and will change fast. So what, we, what we mean by that is, our, um, obviously, if you're operating within the uh, managed cloud environment like AWS or Google, their processes change, their, their APIs can evolve. <clears throat> and if you do that, then you kind of find that you're chasing after them. So you do have to be mindful that you can't always be on top of these things. Um, similarly, uh, feel fast. So if you do intend on keeping on top of these things, and um, do you know, for example, that you're, you, you decide to go after a, a particular piece of architecture? <clears throat> Is that water, please? I nearly got there. Nearly. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, if you do decide to go after a, a particular piece of architecture in the cloud that you want to turn off, and you're like, okay, we're going to spin up a project, we're going to work out the timings when we're going to do it, and then you kind of find that the effort to actually automate that is just too much, that you don't even save any money, be prepared to fail fast and that. So you can't do everything, and again, that kind of leans into automate what makes sense. So go for the high-hitting items, your RDS database, your KMS keys that have been orphaned, your EBS back storage that has been orphaned. And again, final message, I guess, is just that tagging is essential for all things cloud. Um, right from the organizational level to the team level, if you tag, then you have the, um, you have the lineage, and then you can work out where you're spending. So on that note, I think we're going to move on to questions. Oh, I have one thing to add around the tagging. Um, it's not enough to ask people to tag you must enforce it. So um, one of the things we, we learned in Liberty is you can ask, but engineers will do it whenever their stuff gets deleted within an hour if they don't put the tags in when it gets deployed into AWS. It was the best way to ensuring tagging happened across the board. And it certainly was a, a lesson learned and we'll take forward. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody in the organization is preferred now for your artifact to be deleted. Yes, if you don't tag it, so it's not even, you're like, oh no, but you accept it because it's gone. Yeah, and again, it sharpens up the engineers because going back to previous talks, you've got the infrastructure as code, so when they need to do a redeploy, when they have added the tags, they just run a command. It's not click ops, we're not allowed to do that, we're not allowed anywhere near the console, in fact, everything has to be done through the command line. With that, I'm, we are going to open up for any questions. Oh, sorry. Uh, just a quick question there on cost. Uh, Brian, you mentioned um, how did Liberty Mutual's IT team work with uh, with other stakeholders within the organisation to optimise cloud costs and achieve cost savings? Um, that that was down to the data, really. The 
if you want to get engagement from your stakeholders, really from the business, it's good to put it in euros, in pounds, in, in dollars. That gets people's attention. So we did set up a client FinOps group. It was very small. It started off with one analytics person and one sort of dashboarding person uh, and talking to the, the infrastructure team. And they built the dashboards and the reports that then could be taken to the relevant stakeholders, systems owners, to be able to have the conversations about how much non-production was costing, that's why we needed to shut it down uh, on the weekends, how much production was costing, is this appropriate, do we need to look at the five R's, you know, do we need to re-platform, reimagine, or, or sort of re-host, again, all those conversations, but it was driven by data, and the data came from those dashboards where you had true costs. Yeah. Thanks. Perfect, thank you. The tagging, was it primarily to analyze your um, bills or did it have other uses as well? I mean, you mentioned about tagging the resources. Oh, the tagging has a lot of use. Um, the tagging allows us to um, segregate the information around, um, oh, where's my head going? Um, Dora metrics. We use the tagging to be able to separate the Dora metrics in production. Any of those metrics we use the tags for so that, again, you can provide dashboards directly to the engineers so they can see how their own system is performing rather than, okay, they're operating an account and there's multiple different systems, so is that my system, how it performs, or another one? Darren, any Yeah, and uh, tagging, I mean, tagging allows for easier ownership as well because you know, it, it, even if you have, we have our tags now connected to different systems within the organization. So like we are in GitHub. So if you're in GitHub, you can now look up things by application tags. You don't have to remember the name of all the different services. And then you have ownership of those. And then over time, then your team just understands all the information based off of the tagging system. Could you expand a little bit on that point you had on I think it was the second last slide there about educate and incentivize? Sure. So the education is on uh, educating developers around the tooling that is available. So you know, educating on the fact that we promote the well-architected um, process, the fact that we promote using the different AWS tools aside from that, such as the carbon footprint tool and having those regular discussions about cost. Incentivize isn't like a monetary incentivization, it's just kind of like a building and excitement within the teams and, and you know, generally, you know, if, if people are actively seeking to reduce their application costs, you know, through coming up with innovative ways to do so, then we celebrate that and, you know, we, you know, we, we build a lot of, you know, general excitement around the idea. We also do have an internal award system that, you know, if you're if you're knocking out of the park, you, you generally do get an internal award, but it's not a direct link uh, to any particular aspect of cost saving. And I probably should say that, although we've talked a lot about cost saving, it's important to understand it's really cost management because um, there's no point, and I think Darren sort of pointed out, there's no point in having a developer spend five days working to save $50 because those five days have probably cost $500 in development time. So it's important to do that education that we want cost management rather than cost reduction at any price. It's just not sensible. Thanks, guys. Um, so you mentioned 20% uh, cost saving. You mentioned things like moving 70% of, of your workload to the cloud. Uh, you mentioned discounts with your vendors, uh, tagging. Um, so I'm just wondering, does it stop there? Or how does Liberty Mutual continue to monitor and optimize uh, cost savings over time? And have you, any, have you implemented any new or further strategies since? It's probably leveraging Trust Advisor. And again, I know we're talking about a lot of the AWS tools, but they are available in GCP and Azure. To the, for them to start to guide you what else you can do. And then you have to every so often take a step back and understand, has your system's usage changed? Um, 
if you have a successful system, more people will want to use it, more people will load their data onto it, and it could be that your choice of using Lambda no longer makes sense because the system is now active 20 hours of the day. It's not, you know, only active two hours of the day, and then you have to think about, do I need to reimagine it? So it's a constant process, plus you're working out where the vendors are providing new services, which means you no longer need to do that yourself. Darren, any thoughts? I would just say that uh, you have to augment your pure cost management strategy with other strategies within your organization. For example, uh, we have a big push on API first and reuse at the minute. So, you know, if, if one team has built a service to do a particular function, you know, are they sharing that with the organization so that the other teams are aware of it so you're not building two of the same? So I think that is probably the next evolution now that we've got a good hold on the individual cost management is support that reuse. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.